You're listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast. The OPP is brought to you by Natural Stacks, makers of 100% natural and open source supplements designed to help you live optimal. For more information on how to build optimal mental and physical performance into your life, go to naturalstacks.com. Oh, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Optimal Performance Podcast. On today's episode, we have Dr. John Jaquish, the inventor of the X3 bar. This is a this is going to blow your mind. I mean, I, I'm not exaggerating. Dr. Jay Quishin is, a, is an inventor, a doctor, and a, a researcher who also has worked with um, Anthony Robbins on a technology called OsteoStrong. And we talk about human growth hormone, um, the carnivore diet, but specifically we talk about the X3 bar. And the X3 bar is an exercise piece of exercise equipment that's really simple that I've been using for the past month or so. And I'm gonna show you guys some of my results on my Instagram page, that's Coach Sean McCormick. And uh, there's also a special offer for this really amazing piece of exercise equipment, 10 minutes a day and you'll see results. It sounds like an infomercial, it is not. It is the real deal. And he and I talk about why this band-based work exercise uh, approach is so effective and there is science to back it up and uh, I think you'll be fascinated because uh, the uh, old wisdom about Olympic style lifting and um, the things that we think we know about how to gain muscle and and, and and stimulate human growth hormone just go out the window for this thing. So excited to bring this episode to you guys today. And there's, like I said, there's a special offer at the end for $50 off um, this really amazing piece of exercise equipment that I'm just absolutely addicted to. Uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. John Jaquish. You're listening to the Optimal Performance Podcast, and I'm your host, Sean McCormick. It's the OPP. I'm a performance coach, a wellness entrepreneur, a blogger, a speaker, a biohacker, and it's my privilege to bring to you the leading experts in the field of performance. So let's dig right in. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Optimal Performance Podcast. Today's guest is Dr. John J. Quish, who is a researcher, scientist. Um, he's worked closely with names that you know, like Dave Asprey, to help launch X3 Bar, uh, and also is business partners with Tony Robbins uh, and his medical device company. Dr. John J. Quish, welcome to the Optimal Performance Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So I like to give everybody an opportunity to kind of introduce themselves because you know you better than anybody else. So give our listeners a little bit of idea of your story, who you are, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay. Well, like you said, my name is John Jaquish. I'm a doctor of biomedical engineering. Uh, I, I started this adventure into physical medicine. I'm going to help people understand what physical medicine is. Uh, based on my mother's osteoporosis. So she was diagnosed with osteoporosis, I, I thought too young. And uh, I just took a different approach to help her address it. I emulated high impact force with a medical device I developed. And that, uh, that, that impact level force <clears throat> absorbed into the body very slowly, managed by robotics, and, uh, and computerized biofeedback. And within 18 months, she went from having full-blown osteoporosis to having the bones of a 30-year-old. And she had me later in life. So she was in her 70s at the time. So uh, that was I just, you know, uh, it was phenomenal. And I wanted to give her results to a lot of other people. So I uh, ended up building a prototype, testing it in a couple of different places. And now uh, it is everywhere. Uh, it's called OsteoStrong. You can go to OsteoStrong.me to check that out. And that, that's, that's the business that Tony Robbins is part of. Um, and also, like I, for, for that particular, uh, particular product, most people use it as a service. The machines are over $100,000 uh, just because of the robotics and the computerization. But um, they place tremendous forces on the body 
And from like an athletic perspective, it makes an individual more able to tolerate high impact force, gives you a stronger chassis, which enables you to basically uh, uh, be, hold more muscle. One of the limitations of uh, musculature with people, especially older, older people, uh, they don't have the frame to hold it. Because the body won't destroy itself. You have a lot of mechanisms uh, to keep that from happening. So, so that's, uh, that, that, that's how I got started down this physical medicine path. And physical medicine, as opposed to pharmaceutical medicine, is really a, uh, a way to look at the human body so that the, the primary objectives or the first thing that an individual does for their health is looking at the triggers within the human body that can be enacted to either preemptively address or address uh, different disease states. And so, which means avoidance also. And uh, so then I, I began to look at what other things may we as society may be missing and what we can trigger in the human body. And, and one of the most interesting things with the bone density research is we use the most powerful ranges of motion, the impact-ready ranges of motion to – we isolate those and then we allow people to self-impose force. And so what I saw when we did – especially when we did a study in, uh, in a hospital in London – we were looking at individuals who were able to put six, seven, eight times their own body weight through their hip joints. And when I, when I say six, seven, eight times their body weight, like that's crazy. Yeah, like, that's crazy. <laughs> right. Like, like gymnasts who are already highly trained, good at 10 multiples of body weight, sometimes even more than that, but average 10. So I thought, okay, we've got kind of regular people doing this uh right out of the gate like within one or two sessions they're, they're getting to these really high levels uh so what does that really say about human capability and i'm going to say something really controversial here uh because once i looked at the american college of sports medicine's database on what kind of forces people use in the gym now this is I'm sure there's somebody out there who's an advanced weightlifter and they're going to want to argue with this point, but we're not talking about them. We're talking about the average population. The average population puts 1.3 to 1.53 times their body weight through their hip joints when they exercise. Now, that is nowhere near what we saw by isolating these impact ranges of motion. So that told me something so profound that humans are seven times more powerful in the stronger range of motion than they are in the weaker range of motion. Now, like that, that's a massive takeaway. Nobody had really determined that before. So what I thought then was, wow, like that means when we're exercising, we're doing resistance training and this, this is, kind of a generalization, but I thought, you know, no wonder most people don't make a whole lot of progress when they lift or right. said a different way. When you're 16 years old and you pick up weights, you get results really quickly. But as soon as you start using weights that are heavy enough, cause you're, you're basically a, a weak kid. Once you become a little stronger and the joints start feeling the tension a process called neural inhibition happens, which is really muscles shutting down because of pain in the joints. And so you're always limited by your weaker range of motion because it's the greatest exposure to injury in the, in the weaker range. And you're firing the least amount of muscle. So the stimulus with weightlifting, with picking up a standard weight, really just sucks. <laughs> And, and I, yeah, and it's a, I, I'm pretty sure I'm like the most hated guy in fitness right now. Cause there's a lot of people with emotional ties to lifting weights. Yes. But Hey, you know, I go, Hey guys, look around. There is like one tenth of 1% of the people who even look like they work out. Like, like there are some people who 
manage to get through the weaker ranges of motion, maybe have an optimized tendon layout, sort of like a genetic mutant where they just don't have as much pain in weaker ranges than others. I know Mike Tyson's one of those guys. There's some some commentary that was made about how how he has more access to his pectorals and weaker range of motion than stronger range of motion. He had he had some uh, uh, physiologists like just examine him, and he's just kind of an anomaly, which is why why it explained how he could get inside of the range of, of motion of the punching range of the opponent and basically give a short jab and deliver almost a full amount of power. So. <clears throat> So what, what's what, what ended up happening is I made these observations and I think no wonder people do more than one set. You wouldn't do more than one set of, of exposure to the sun to get a suntan. You wouldn't go outside and then come inside and rest and then go outside again in the hot sun and then come in. Like you just you give yourself sunburn. You'd overstimulate. Right. Yeah. Right. So the idea is we wanted to. Like, like we're, we're having to do multiple sets. People are having to do multiple sets because the stimulus is just lame. And what if and this is what I sat there and like, like first I said, like, what if we could change the weight and make it extremely heavier in the stronger range versus the weaker range? Now, like, uh, um, uh, West side barbell had been doing that in Ohio, right? Uh, but they, they put smaller bands and then they put weight on the bar too. And so let's say when they're doing a bench press, they got X weight sitting on their chest and 1.2 X at full extension. Well, my thesis from my bone density research, and you can't look at these studies alone. There's a lot of people who try and review the research page. They grab one sentence out of one study and they say, well, this isn't what you're doing. And, of course, they don't know how to read research because there's a reason I have more than one reference. Uh, you you look at these things together, you say, no, 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 it's not one versus 1.2. It's one versus seven. So why don't we forget about the weight and dramatically increase the variance? And when we do that, we can go to a much deeper level of fatigue in different ranges of motion simultaneously in one set and trigger a massive amount of growth. And then my second thought was, uh, a lot of people are going to be mad at me for saying this. <laughs> but you're used to that by now. Uh, yeah, you know, it's, it's <laughs> probably it's not, no, it's, it's not smart people. So it's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been, well, it, Hey, there's, there's, uh, there's always, um, it's a combination between people. There's a lot of crummy fitness products, especially home fitness products out there. And so it's easy to just be dismissive and say, this is just like something I've already seen. It's not like somebody goes, Oh, it uses a rubber band. I can buy a rubber band at Walmart for $5. Why is this $500? Well, because it's literally 50 to a hundred times more powerful. So it's, it's like, do you want relevant weight or irrelevant weight? Right. And and for those for those who have who for who are hearing this for the first time that have never experienced the X3 bar, um it it is unlike any piece of exercise equipment I've ever experienced. And I am a lifelong athlete, you know, collegiate um scholarship athlete and and it delivers results. This is this, here's my problem, John. As I was preparing, as I was as I'm lifting, as you know, I'm on week two of or week two and a half of of using the X3 bar, and I've had a couple of couple of days right. off. I've been following the correct protocol, and I'm I'm watching my body change its shape, right. like I'm, daily, daily, like daily. like. One day to the next, I'm I'm and I'm taking pictures of this. So by by the time you know you guys can you guys can follow follow me on Instagram to sort of watch my progression. But the results that you get from this very simple and very elegant exercise uh, system is is astounding, and it's going to be really hard for this not to sound like an infomercial because I love it so much. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, and I get so, it all the time. Yeah, I, I'm sure you do, yeah. and, and and I and I know that uh, just from from the research 
is, you know, the, the people that are, that are submitting reviews, they get flagged on Amazon because they sound like your cousin is doing it for you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and so, so let me, let me just tell a little bit about, about my experience with this. And, and I reached out because, you know, I was, I kept seeing it on the internet and I kept seeing it on Instagram and Facebook. And I was like, what, what, there must be something to this. And you as a physical specimen, um, you're, you're just jacked. I mean, like, um, uh, 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 this is new to me. Like, <laughs> really? Your you physique? Know, like a regular guy. Like, I, I mean, I probably looked a little muscular if I took my shirt off, but if I was wearing a shirt, nobody would know I worked out two years ago. Now I'm a lean 220 pounds and it's the subject of, you know, that we're talking about whenever I walk into a place or meet somebody new, it's like, Jesus, like, do you play in the NFL? What have you been doing? Yeah. 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 Like, well, are you a UFC fighter? Like, well, who are you? Yeah. Yeah. They expect they should know me because looking like I look right now is so abnormal. Uh, which I would argue it's not. I mean, I'm low body fat, uh, 220 pounds. It's, it's, and and then, then I get the steroid comment, which is like, okay, a lean 220 pounds is not a steroid statistic. Just so you know, when somebody's 350 pounds and lean, yeah. Ask that question to that guy. Right. Right. So the key to this, and I, and I want to dumb it down for people. Uh, it's, it's literally 10 minute, a 10 minute workout. You do a series, you do four, you know, I'm only as far as in there, you know, maybe there's more, but I'm doing four different lifts to absolute exhaustion, slowly, carefully focusing exclusively on just absolutely destroying the muscle, like going to total failure and in, as in you, all ranges of motion, like first you fatigue the strong range and then you diminish the range. Right. So you fatigue the mid range. So like when you're firing all muscle in the stronger range, you fatigue that range, which is something you cannot do with a weight. Then in the same experience without letting blood in the muscle, which begins the recovery process. So when you do like multiple sets, you put the weight down or you do different ranges and break it up, you're letting blood in and you're giving the central nervous system an inconsistent signal. Right. Well, here by not, not stopping the experience, you're taking the muscle to a far deeper level of fatigue and thereby getting more growth. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, doing, doing, you know, 25 uh, reps of a bicep curl and at rep eight, I'm like, okay, I can't quite go to that to that top range it's tense it's it's tense at the very top and like you mentioned um it's that's when it's you're carrying the most load then i can go to halfway you know reps 8 through 16 17 and then you know reps 17 through 25 i'm barely moving and i'm and and i have and by the time i set the bar down my biceps are on fire like i can feel it behind my shoulders sure your core's on fire too and my core's on fire because I'm using all of those stabilizer muscles. Um, I think that is what is that is what is so that's what's so impressive about this is is for our listeners who want the most from the least this minimum effective dose. How can I get how can I get the most gains? How can I get stronger? How can I build muscle in the shortest period of time? Um, this is it, and it delivers every time that I do it. Right. That's the point. Yeah. Right. And it's, do you it's, ever feel like you're a risk of injury? I don't. I don't. You know, I, I, I never I, I never do. And and that's that's a lot of the feedback that I see too is people who have complaining, you know, people who have said, you know, I've had joint injuries, I've had, you know, rotator cuff um, surgeries, and this is the only piece of equipment that I can use that doesn't aggravate that injury. Um, because, because it's, it's, it's caters to that. So, so tell me, so walk me through a little bit of the process of, you know, as you're, as you're, you're, you're building this concept of, you know, maximum exertion for, for gains, um, for, for the, for the highest level of results. Like when, when did you first start to tinker around with, with, uh, with the X3 bar? 
<clears throat> so uh, it was about three years ago I had the idea uh, after looking at those two data sets and realizing just just how much more powerful the strong range is versus the weak range. And just I, conclusion I came to is like we don't need weight. We don't even need band bands with weights. We need just bands. Like because the like in the weak range, you suck. Like you don't you can't handle very much. There's a reason you don't touch your knee to the ground with every step you take as you sprint. So you can get a full range of motion. Like sprinters use seven degrees of action uh, behind their knee where they have 180 degrees available. Why? It's because only seven degrees are efficient. Like anything, in fact, the probably the first two of those seven is just carrying you forward until you can fire again. And so maybe it's really only like five degrees, but seven degrees in use total. So we, we always choose our stronger range of motion. You know, if you're going to carry something heavy, you don't say, well, let me make sure I lift it from the ground so I get a full range. You're going to try and be as efficient as possible. You're going to try and isolate the stronger range of motion. So uh, that's, that's just how we do it. And when you fatigue in the stronger range of motion, you, that, that translates throughout the muscle. And then when you can fatigue like what we're doing, stronger mid-range and then weak range you're really getting a deeper level of stimulus that you just can't get anywhere else so i had all this in my head and and i thought well yeah i don't think training with because i thought about just just writing a book about bands right how like bands would be the best and so they made some pull-up assist bands that were kind of heavy uh, right. La latex is really the only way to go. Like, like the molded rubber bands, uh, they kind of stretch out and they're usually not that thick. And even when they look the same as latex, bands, that's another thing. Like bands all look the same on a small video on your phone, but they are not the same. Uh, a molded rubber is barely worth touching. Uh, you, you really want to go with layered latex, even if you're allergic to latex, which Ironically, I actually am. So whenever I use it, I just have to take a shower and wash all latex off my skin. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, I know. I know. It's terrible. <laughs> I found that out the hard way. Yeah. Cruel I, irony. I, the, it is only 1% of the population is allergic to latex. I just happen to be part of that 1%. And the funny thing was, I, the way I noticed it was um, I was getting these um, swollen eyelids from blocked tear ducts. And I got bit by a spider. Uh, on the eyelid in uh, in Shanghai uh, a couple years ago when I was manufacturing the first round of uh, prototype medical devices. By the way, I only make stuff in America now. Oh, nice. No more China. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, just got to look out for the American worker. So, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so what happened, uh, I, I thought this was like a byproduct of that the spider bite. And so and my eyelids would get swollen all the time. And then so finally I, I I looked at the bands and I thought, you know, I wonder if this could just be latex, just irritating my eyelids and shutting off the pores. And sure enough, if I just start, started washing my hands uh, and then if I was doing like, like, you know, work out with my shirt off or something like that, just taking a shower afterward, problem went away. Yeah. So, um, so back to the, the story, like I got these heavy pull up assist bands. It was the only way you could find a heavy band was so people can, you know, they like the offload part of their body weight at the bottom of the pull up. Right. And so, uh, I saw some of these sitting around CrossFit gyms and I never did CrossFit. Uh, but I, I, I saw them around CrossFit gyms. And just being in med medical device industry, physical medicine, I look at everything exercise. And, and so I'd seen these around. I, I tried doing a couple different exercises, just stepping on it and doing a deadlift. Felt like my ankles were going to snap inward. And the problem is when you make a joint uncomfortable, you have a process that starts called neural inhibition. And neural inhibition basically means when you're uncomfortable – your muscles start shutting off. Like your body doesn't like that. It does not want to create an injury. So the idea that you can power through because you're tough, which 
every Billy badass and Tommy tough guy on the internet thinks that's what they do. They don't, they are just injuring themselves and you know, they won't, they won't be lifting in a couple of years because they're just making mistakes on a regular basis. So, um, so the, uh, it was pretty just clear, like you couldn't exercise with just bands. Like what, what we really needed was a super powerful full spec Olympic bar that could handle, you know, between 500 and a thousand pounds, because like I said, people are seven times stronger. So the weight that you're going to handle is far beyond what you think you're going to handle uh, with this Olympic bar. And then I need a way to mount the banding, mount the latex to the ground. So I got a, uh, a polyethylene plating, uh, normally used for the decks of boats and ships, uh, and, and, uh, custom ground some of that plating so that we could attach the bands to the ground and that, and that between the two of those and a series of, uh, four bands, that was X3. That was the, the X3 was born. And so the first thing I did was uh, Dave Asprey was already a buddy of mine. And I jumped on an airplane, flew to his house, and I wanted to show him my new toy. And we screwed around with it a couple of days and kicked some ideas around how we would launch it and how uh, how he could help. And uh, fun guy, by the way. Uh, yeah. 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 He, his mind is moving so quick. And uh, a great marketing mind, a great uh, science mind. The uh, I'm glad he's doing what he's doing because he's he's a gift to the world. So uh, and and then my next flight was uh, to see Tony Robbins and show it to Tony Robbins. So uh, I got some some advice from some of these just titans of uh, of let's call it biohacking or physical medicine, which is what I prefer to call it. Uh, and then, and then, so I was, I was off. I, I did, uh, so it took me a little while to get it together because, uh, I, I was kicking around some different designs and I needed to use a certain type of steel because like, I couldn't make this thing out of plastic. I couldn't, couldn't make, yeah, it needed to be really powerful. And I think that's also something that doesn't come through in video. Like people see me doing a curl with latex banding and they're like, well, you know, anybody can do that. Like, you know, I can, I see people do that at like yoga class or whatever. Nah, no, you don't. Because <laughs> like that top of that curl may be 150 pounds. Bottom of the curl may be 50, but you like all, all things considered, it's an incredible amount of force that you need to really trigger growth and the product needed to be able to deliver the latex needed to be able to deliver and the metal needed to be able to handle it. And that's how we were going to trigger people to grow. And, uh, and then ultimately in the research, uh, the reason I called it X3 was because it's a great research study that took some of the things that were being done with adding bands to weights, and it showed that it made people stronger, three times stronger over the same given period of time to the control, to the control group. Uh, and they used Cornell athletes for this study. Now, of course, that was only using banding and weights. And we're going way higher in weight with more repetitions than that. So whatever results with that, if the variable that they used was variance, and they added a small bit of variance and saw that kind of result. If you have more variance, you'll have more result. And we're using drastically more variance. So uh, I actually expect people with far greater results uh, using this. I, it only takes one minute to do a little bit of digging and you just see – review after review after review of people saying, oh my God, yeah. you really only need to work out for 10 minutes and you're not sore and you're not sore the next day and it doesn't strain your body and holy cow, like I can actually see my biceps and I can actually see the vascularity in my, you know, in my calves and in my forearms and, and 
it's uh, it's 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 really kind of amazing. And and I think and obviously the reason why you're you know, you're tearing down a lot of, um, preconceived notions about how to work out effectively, you know, like I, I think about, you know, this is sort of the opposite of Pilates, right? Pilates is full extension, almost hyper extension, and then doing lots of quick little two, three inch or longer range of motion at a full extension. And this is, um, this is not that, and this is also not, loading up plates on a straight bar and um, having no no resistance at the bottom of the lift on your chest and then pushing to the top and then resting at full extension and then and then the deceleration down to the bottom where you rest again. And I heard you say once that it's confusing to the muscle when you're going through, let's just call it, let's just envision a, a bench press. You're you're resting and then you push and you rest at the top and yeah, you if you decel- lock the joint at the top, you're turning the muscle on, you're turning the muscle off, turning the muscle on, turning the muscle off. Does that show the central nervous system a deficit of anything? No, it doesn't. It just so, confuses. Yeah, and, and, and well, I actually try not to use the word confusion because people think like muscle confusion is still a thing. Oh, right. Yeah, it's been disproven. Uh, it's just complete garbage data. It's just like anybody doing P90X still like, I'm sorry, but you know, workouts work except not yours. Uh, uh, or I mean not as well because by just by mixing up the exercises, you don't shock the system into growth. That's not a thing. So, uh, yeah, but ultimately everything we're trying to get out of exercise and this is like the highest Uh, level of like what what adaptation is you're showing your central nervous system you're at a deficit of something so if you want to show a definite uh, a deficit of bicep volume you need to exhaust from a myofibril perspective which only happens in the strong range by the way uh, <clears throat> then you need to exhaust from a sarcoplasmic perspective. So you need to get rid of all the ATP, glycogen, creatine, phosphate. So never rest at the bottom, never lock the joint at the top because that lets blood in and starts replacing those fuels. So if you're slowly replacing while you're using, you, you're not, you're not showing the central nervous system a clear signal for growth. You're just not doing it. So, so by using the protocol that, that, that I designed and every once in a while, I, I see on like the users group, we have some super fans in the users group, uh, and that's on Facebook X, X3 of our users group. Somebody wants to add something special to the program to get even more results. So they're like, I'm doing a rest pause protocol, which is just sort of like one rep and then you stop and then one rep and then you stop. And I don't want to discourage anybody, but it's usually a long sigh. And I tell somebody from my from my staff, can you just please answer this? Because I just find it upsetting. Uh, uh, you know, you, you missed the point here. Constant tension. You need to leave constant tension on the muscle to get um, the most complete exhaustion. Uh, um, and then once you go to fatigue like that, you will have tremendous results. One th- one question that I have, um, which you can probably help clarify for me, is if we're not extending to the full range of motion, are we building a muscle that is going to look aesthetically more contracted? That's a great question. Uh, no. Basically, we're using – like so you don't ever lock your knees when you sprint. Nope, I sure right. don't. Right. Yep. You'd break them both if you did. <laughs> uh, and, and some of the most powerful legs in the world are on sprinters. So, um, yeah, you don't need to lock out the joint. Like that's – like you can do lockouts. Like I have had some physical therapists say like I need lockouts as part of my protocols or a problem doing lockouts with X3 because they use it for rehabilitation. And I'm like, yeah, no, absolutely not. But – 
if your goal is to be as strong as possible, it's best not to lock out and just go to the top of the movement. So you're going from the power position to the weaker range of motion, and that's your sweet spot. So you don't ever discharge the load and let the band go slack at the bottom. And you also don't lock the joint at the top. Yeah. But it's, it's easy to follow, especially if you watch some of the videos. There's probably somebody listening going, man, I, I don't really know exactly what he's talking about. Everything's in video on the website. Yeah. It shows you exactly what to do. So it's um, it's really easy to follow. Hey, one thing you said, which I almost never cover in podcasts, there's no soreness. Do you yeah. Know, do you know why? No. This is another thing that people just just get enraged over. Every, <laughs> uh, again, it's Billy Badass and Tommy Tough Guy who who define themselves. Yeah. Their, their life is defined by I lift dangerous weights. Um, that's all they have to say for themselves. It, the um, the the reason you don't get sore is because most of what you do with standard weights is giving you a significant amount of joint damage. Not permanent or anything, but a lot of what people perceive as exercise soreness is it's in the joints, it's not in the muscle. Really? Yeah. And you don't your body doesn't like that. And even in some of the micro tearing. Now, the theory of like small tears in the muscle like grow back and become more powerful, fixing, you know, the tears. Well, okay, never mind, like, that That kind of denies, like, what scar tissue is, which is not functional. Uh, but there are micro tears, and they do heal without scar tissue. However, they have nothing to do with muscle growth. In fact, cyclists have some of the greatest amount of muscle tearing and, and marathon runners, and they don't have big anything. Yeah. Right? They don't grow any muscle. Right. So they have far more micro tears than people who lift weights. So micro tears have nothing to do with growth. There's two types of muscle growth. There's sarcoplasmic, meaning protein synthesis, usually showing a deficit of contractile tissue, which again, like gymnasts get a big sarcoplasmic effect. Usually weightlifters don't. Uh, like sort of one rep maximum weightlifter guys do. Of course, there's a high risk associated with that. But the other type of muscular growth is sarcoplasmic. It's holding more fuel in the cell. And this is what bodybuilders really capitalize on. It's holding more ATP, glycogen, and creatine phosphate in the cells. But to get to that, like, uh, you, don't, you don't have to beat up on the joint. Not at all. That's tough to, it's tough to hear, man, because everything that I've ever heard about lifting and about Olympic style weightlifting, about explosive, yeah. you know, fast twitch muscle fibers since I was, you know, 13, 14 playing high school football. Sure. Is that if, if you're not sore, you're not working hard enough. Right. And, and <laughs> if you're not, if, if you're not walking with a waddle the day after leg day, it means you didn't do enough weight and, or it means you didn't, you know, your form was poor. And I think, I think that I speak for a lot of our listeners when I say that that's a hard thing. That's a hard fallacy to re redefine. Right. And, and there's a lot of things in there that you just said that are real science. There is such a thing as fast as slow twitch muscle, but I've also got a piece of uh, clinical research that shows that pretty much all athletic activity grows both types. Yeah, that makes sense. Whether so, you're it, it, a, a it, boxer it, or a pro Am I allowed to use profanity on your program? Let it fly, man. Yeah, cool. absolutely. Yeah, so basically who fucking cares? Yeah. Like if it doesn't matter, then why are we even talking about the principle? Like, yes, there's two different types of, of growth, but they both fire when you're lifting a weight. It's not like some somebody needs to lift something heavy and the body's going, you know what? We were like running marathons better. So we're just not going to turn like half the muscle on. Like – Right. Get you killed in nature. <laughs> like, that's, right. No, that's not how things work. So, uh, yeah, you, you, like, it just all, 
Like, and, and, and there's, there's other uh, things. In fact, I'm, I'm launching a, uh, a video series called Falsehoods of Fitness. And I've got about 20 different videos I'm going to make. They're going to be like between five and, and uh, 10 minutes. And I'm actually going to hit a lot of those things like fast and slow twitch muscle. And it's, you know, it's not that it, the idea that there's two types, there's actually three types, but uh, of diff, uh, of muscle, it, it's not that it, it doesn't exist. It's, it's just like it doesn't matter. So oh, here's another one. Uh, progressive resistance. I love hearing these guys that just, you know, they add a tiny bit of weight and then they produce the same amount of repetitions or one repetition. And then it's like, therefore, they got stronger. These are people that don't know the difference between a strategy and a result because they're, 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 the principle is the result. Like if you can progress your resistance, that means you already got stronger. That doesn't mean you're getting stronger next time. <laughs> Solid point. Yeah, right. that makes that's sense. Like, that's like asking a high school kid, hey, what do you want to do when you grow up? And the kid goes, I'm just going to cash checks. <laughs> and, and you're yeah. like, so you're going to have a job? No, no, somebody's just going to pay me. <laughs> like, I'm just going to go to the bank every day and I'll be rich. And you're like, so <laughs> okay, yeah, you should do some progressive resistance too. Um, right. Um, and it also denies the idea that like, why are runners strong? Like, they don't incrementally get heavier every time they sprint. Right. So they can get faster and build more right. powerful. Like it's just one of those principles that, yeah, if you add a tiny amount of weight, that, that is one way to maybe continue to trigger growth. But it's not a superior way. It's just a way. Right. It, and, if, you're, if you're able to put on an additional 2.5 pound plate on the end of your straight bar for right. your bench press and you can lift it, well, shit, look at that. You're stronger. <laughs> you're except all- except then, then, then I like to go, except maybe you could have done that last time. So maybe yeah. you didn't gain anything. Right. Because like, you didn't try that last time, did you? Chicken or the egg. Yeah, man. It's just like there's like – exhausting the muscle showing the central nervous system that there's a deficit like the the principle of, of variance sits over the top of any other principle because if you are moving a weight through multiple ranges of motion then you have different capability in multiple ranges of motion and if you're using the same weight you are leaving the gains behind you're just not stimulating. Not like you could. So like all these other principles, uh, uh, just, d- just different positioning or how you, how you need to do uh, uh, lateral raises and uh, 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 overhead presses to fully develop the uh, deltoids. That's bullshit. <laughs> That's so not true. So, uh, yeah, so all these, all these principles that are out there, some of them are right and some of them are wrong. Uh, yeah, some of them are dead wrong, but ultimately like what we're talking about right now with variable resistance, especially making it as powerful as X3 has made it. It's just like, like all these other principles just don't mean anything. Who gets the most worked up by your system and and the results? Uh, usually, uh, and interestingly, people who don't seem like they work out, <laughs> like internet commenters who, who you look at, of course, them, like fat or they, they're like high school males, really angry high school males that it's just funny. Like you look at and they're like, oh yeah, like that'll never work. And you look at them and you're like, hmm, hmm Okay. Like, <laughs> does your mom know you're up right now? <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and um, also, uh, for some strange reason, the people who seem to misspell every third word, they're really upset by this, too. <laughs> I see yeah. that. Yeah, okay. But right. so, so, I, I, I just it's I, it's so entertaining at this point. OK, but besides the besides the basement, the basement dwelling trolls. Yeah. Who, who what sort of qualified or experienced people balk at? balk at it the most uh some of the guys who have built like some programming they've made their living by teaching people how to lift weights uh and they've 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 got a business tied up in lifting weights and and like hey weights work for some people but not the majority 
Like, like look around. Like we, we as a society, we put fitness on a pedestal, as we should. We should all be healthier. We should all be more attractive. We should all feel better when we walk down the street. I think everybody deserves that if they're willing to put in some work. But you see people going to gyms year after year and nothing changes. Yeah. This is the vast majority of people. And and here's here's a statistic for you. 6.6% of adult males over 18 in the United States have used anabolic steroids. Whoa. I know, right? Do 6.6% of males look like bodybuilders or professional athletes? No way. I mean, think. You put 100 people in the room. You get, you know, six and a half people that look like bodybuilders? <laughs> no. Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe if you have 10,000 people in a room, you got one that's just like, whoa, that guy's in shape. You can't even tell. You can't even tell most of these people work out. Like, why are we so in love with these principles that are being hammered down on us by some of the gurus out there when they're clearly not effective for the majority of people? Like 99% of the population is just totally frustrated with exercising. And, and here's another thing. I uh, uh, We sold a uh, uh, little, uh, like, like, like six and a half thousand units, right? It's a new company. So, you know, we, we just, just getting started. Six and a half thousand X3s are out there in circulation. So we have 1,300 super fans in, in the users group. And so most people say like a home fitness product, oh, you know, only like, like nobody's going to use that. It's going to, you know, sit under your bed and collect dust. Uh, no, it won't because it actually produces results, which is why we have seen so many uh, incredible stories come out of this. It works. So people don't skip it. And so when people say, oh, uh, general population doesn't work out because they're lazy. Nah, I don't believe that. I don't buy that at all. They're not lazy. They're frustrated with not seeing results. But once you give them results, they're committed. They like it. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that's what makes this piece of equipment so different is that, you know, for those of us who are busy, who we're all busy, we, we all live busy lives. We've all got stuff that we should be doing. And, and the two and a half hour round trip in the car to the gym to half ass it on the treadmill for a little bit to half ass it in the squat rack for a little bit, or even to just, you know, work, work really hard. Um, if I can, if I can condense that two and a half hours with a sore elbow the next day and a hip right. that's kind of funky and, and switch that out for 10 minutes a day, mm -hmm. five, five days a week, um, in my living room while I watch TV, man, I'll take that any day of the week. And yeah. if it, if it works and I can look in the mirror, you know, after my third workout and go, Holy smokes, look right. at those, look at those biceps. It They're works popping better than anything else that you'd be doing. So, and I know some people who are addicted to going to the gym. They love it for social reasons. That's where all their buddies meet up. So they just take their X3 to the gym. <laughs> Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. Like, in fact, so I have had so many people say, like, I needed to buy your product. Uh, there's, like, two guys at my gym that are in, like, just getting in better shape every day I see them. And they're only using your product. And I ask them, like, why do you still come in here? And they're like, hey, I don't know, habit. Like, or I keep my X3 in my locker. And, it, yeah, like... That was a little funny to me, but hey, like there's nothing wrong with that. There's there's actually more than 30 gyms that have X3s. So you can go to your gym and just use it there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the that's another feature of it too that I really like is it's is it you can you can bring it on your carry-on. You can travel with it really easily. Yeah, TSA does not love it. Um it's a big metal bar. So I, I always check mine. It's not 
50 percent of the time, just when I when I was prototyping it, I'd try and get it through security and half the time they'd let it go. Uh, and then the other half the time they go, yeah, you could hit somebody with this. And I think that's funny because they let people with canes and skateboards go through all the time. Well, those can be used as weapons, but whatever. Uh, so until the TSA officially approves it as a rehabilitation device, um, which it is, uh, we can, we can get it through every time then, but until then it's like, I just check a bag. Yeah. So I'm, I'm two, two and a half weeks in and loving it. And, awesome. uh, I'm curious where, you know, where the exercises go because, cause as of now, and I just finished my, I just finished my, my workout for the day that took me, uh, I, it took me about eight and a half minutes cause I was focused and cooking. Um, I did, um, I did deadlift curl, um, um, bent over row and calf raises. And that effectively, you know, it's two leg exercises and two back and bicep exercises. And I'm curious, you know, to kind of skip forward a little bit in the, in, in the book to see what sort, where do we go from there? Because obviously the bands, um, become thicker and more resistant, but where do, where does the variability in the exercise come in and, and how, how did you develop that? Uh, that just picking the exercises was very much trial and error. That's another thing I've been, uh, kind of criticized on. I, the, the program right now is very aesthetically focused. Um, I believe more people are interested in looking good as opposed to being the ultimate CrossFit athlete or something like that. Like, so like a CrossFit person would never do bicep curls because that's not going to help them. Uh, with their with their competitive lifts, so a lot of those guys are just like like I remember I, I got like a one star review from some guy that goes oh bicep curls are so nineties and I'm like okay skip <laughs> like really <laughs> that's your problem but you know whatever uh, so so it is it is focused for the person who really wants to be high performance, also look high performance. Calf raises is another thing. Uh, ben Greenfield gave me a hard time about the calf raises. Like, why would you do calf raises? Like, you're getting that in the deadlift. And I said, yeah, not to the same degree. Like, uh, I even in like, I think it was like week three or four, I made this comment, like the, the key to having great calves is being born with great calves. I, I proved myself wrong because my calves never looked like I had trained them a day in my life and I've been training them for 20 years with weights. But now it looks like somebody glued a ribeye steak to the back of each of my legs with the way my calves stick out and have like an inch of depth. Um, just from that, that isolation calf raise that we're doing. So, so I, in, in the program that exists right now, it does focus on some aesthetic movements. Now, if somebody's like doing CrossFit and they want to use this for CrossFit assist – Ultimately, and this we before we when we talked earlier, like like I, I said, like somebody who is doing CrossFit and they want to use X3, they can use X3 to assist in their CrossFit, but they they wouldn't do something like the calf raise. They would do they would emulate some of their lifts. They would do a deadlift. They might do like an overhead press and then also lock into the overhead position and do squats. With holding the bar over the head, Ben Greenfield has, uh, has been enjoying doing that. So ultimately, slightly different movements. But the way the program is right now, very aesthetic focused. You're going to stick to some of those same movements. The squat is going to move to a single leg squat, uh, which gives you more stabilization firing, which upregulates growth hormone. Uh, and also... It allows you to use your your resources all focused on one leg at a time, which is really like unless you're a kangaroo, you run on one leg at a time, right? So <laughs> I, I say this to trainers all the time, and they kind of stare at me for a minute and then smile, like you know, yeah, you know, that guy's got a point. Yeah, you're right. Uh, yeah, we don't hop on two legs, so we fire one leg at a time. So if you start squatting like that, uh biomechanics 
are improved because you have to balance your your hips and, and your shoulders. You have to. You don't have choice. It forces you to reinforce a, a, a better level of biomechanics, uh, which improves your two-legged squat. If you do like competitions with two leg squats like you, you that that's gonna that, that better supporting uh, uh joint firing is uh, is gonna help uh also in the advanced programming beyond the 12 weeks there's some static holds in the stronger range to really make sure that you're getting so not locked out but just short of lockout holding in those positions so you can really t- make sure you are taking the muscle to absolute fatigue. Got it. Okay. I can see, I can see that. Can you talk a little bit more about, um, stabilization and how that, I mean, you said it, you said a, a hot button phrase, growth hormone. Let's talk about growth hormone a little bit. The, the two things that are talked about the most when it comes to performance, and maybe this is the reason I get some of these steroid comments, um, which are, like I said, just kind of nuts. Uh, and, and also, like I said, made by people who don't look like they've ever worked out. Right. The, or, I mean, hey, also, like most of trolling is just jealousy. You know, they're, right. they're angry somebody's in better shape than them, so they just insult. You know, it's flattery. Mr. Mr. Guys who have been Mr. Olympia get insulted all day long. So, right. okay. Uh, but there is there are two things that are happening uh, which are highly anabolic beyond just loading the muscle with X3. Uh, there is a tremendous upregulation of growth hormone and testosterone with the use of X3. And I'll explain why. So uh, I wrote a meta-analysis uh, in 2016 on growth hormone. And, uh, so a meta analysis for the people who are listening that don't know what that is. It's when all of the research on one particular subject is brought into one study and condensed and measured via statistics to control for like one study had a large sample size, one study had a small sample size. And so you weight them a little differently for significance. And then you come up with a sort of score or level of effectiveness uh, of, and most importantly, a p-value, which shows you whether, you whether you have statistical significance. Basically, what I discovered was in 23 different data sets and previously published studies, we found in this study, 23 different data sets, positive changes in growth hormone based on stabilization firing anywhere from 400 to 2,600 percent per single session. And the, the, the changes between what, what was different between the 400 percent and the 2,600 percent had to do with uh, loading. So if you had an incredible amount of load, there was more stabilizers that were fired. So like if you were doing like a little bit of balancing on, on both legs, just held, you know, maybe a, a 120 degree angle of inclusion behind your knee, you've got your core's activated and you're doing some beyond tonic contractions to keep yourself from falling over. And that's got a tiny uh, growth hormone effect. If you do it on a balance board, it has a more so growth hormone effect. If you've got a weight on your back, like in a squat, and you do free weight squats, you have an even greater effect. Let's say even on a flat piece of ground. So just a flat piece of ground, you can increase your growth hormone by 600% by doing just a standard squat with a bar. Guess how much growth hormone gets released in a leg press? Oh man, I have no idea. How much? Zero. None. There's no stabilization firing. Ah. So doesn't it s- seem like a great idea to upregulate the growth hormone and the receptors at the same time? Because that's what you're doing. Why is that? Is it because you're you're firing all the st- little stabilize- stabilizer muscles around the bigger yeah. ones? Yeah. It's just because you have to be stable. And then when you add load – now let me ask another question. 
So we know what happens when you have a bar on your back and it's got some weight on it, an exhausting level of weight. Now what happens when you use X3? When you're hyperloading the stronger range of motion, now you're using even more stabilizers at more repetitions. So longer time under tension with a higher weight. What, what's the stabilization firing there? Well, it's even greater. Right. So that may be approaching some of the 2000% areas that we've seen, which is why I, you know, I have veins showing in my abs uh, and I do no cardio. I haven't done cardio in years uh, and I'm 42 years old. So that massive upregulation of growth hormone is something that happens with X3 and uh, you know, you can't, can't really do anything beyond that yet, though I'm working on something uh, you know, that's going to come in the, you know, future uh, uh it, well it's going to be it's going to be an, an accessory to uh to x3 to get even more growth hormone out, out of that but like uh, the, the way i am now like my nutrition's great and, and everything but a lot of people have great nutrition at 42 years old and they've still you know they're still fat or they still yeah. look nothing well, uh, uh, let's talk well, about nutrition a little bit well let me let me just switch to testosterone first Yes, please. And explain, yeah. So, um, and by the way, that that growth hormone uh, meta analysis actually got me a, a position as one of the editors of the Journal of Steroids and Hormonal Science. Uh, so, I'm, actually, I'm an editor of three different medical journals. Uh, that one being a really important one. Now, that's hormones and anabolics for the treatment of disease. Not like people hear the name, they think, oh, it's a, a medical journal about cheating in sports. Yeah, there's not a lot of medical journals written about that. So, uh, yeah, it's, this, is, this is therapies that, that this, this journal is about. But ultimately, wouldn't we rather go with a physical medicine solution first? Any, anybody says to me, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about taking growth hormone. You can make more growth hormone. Your body has the ability to do it, like way more. And you can be lean. Just apply the principle and you know, like, like these, some of these growth hormone supplements, uh, uh, whatever's out there, like just, just try X3 first and, uh, you, you won't ever think about taking the GH supplements again. Now, testosterone is upregulated mostly based on how much force you're putting through the body. And because with X3, we're hyperloading in the stronger range and using that with more repetitions, the same thing happens. You get more testosterone out of your exercise too. So it is just such an anabolic workout uh, by design. This is where I was thinking, like right, right out of the gate, because that's that was part of my background, that endocrinology research with anabolic hormones. Uh, that's why we have older guys. I, I was looking at some of the before and after pictures that have been submitted. Guys in their 50s who've never had a six pack in their life within 12 weeks have a six pack. Didn't do any cardio. Some of them didn't even change their nutrition. And it just happened with the use of X3. That, that we're so, we're so used to that's It's such a novel. It's, it's almost, it's almost unbelievable. And you're probably sick hearing that, but, it's the, the results. I mean, the results that like that, that you're talking about are so uncommon with any other sort of fitness protocol that, uh, that it's, it's almost like, you know, it doesn't, it almost, there's like this cognitive dissonance around sure. those types of results, you know, it's, uh, the, the people, the, the good news is it's only there's, there's two versions of the product. There's the original and then we have the pro version, which is a little bit more expensive, but uh, and it's, it's all steel, neural steel, like, like, a, uh, looks like an Olympic bar functions like an Olympic bar. Um, the, uh, it's a pretty small price to pay if it delivers. Now somebody says, I can't believe $500. That's crazy. And I go, what would you pay for 20 pounds of muscle? 
And they're like, I'd like $10,000. Yeah, right. So, you know, <laughs> you might want to give it a shot. We do have a return policy. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth the experiment. And, and also I notice, like, because I can see the click patterns on the website. Somebody goes to the science page. They immediately go to the buy page like a minute later. Right. When they, when they read it, it's it, most people don't really want to learn anything. Uh, they might glance at something and just be judgmental or be so blinded by, uh, you know, what they think they know that they oh, this is, you know, it's not true, uh, whatever. But it's, it's amazing that you read the science page and you'll say, wow, if this guy's right, then so much of what we've been doing is wrong. But it's, it's worth a shot because this is pretty crystal clear how this works and uh, never heard anything like this before. So they go for it and uh, they never go back. Yeah. When I, when I jumped into the X three bar users group and started to sort of get a, get a t sense of what people were saying and how they were talking, you know, one guy made a point that said, uh, there's a reason why you don't find these used on the internet. You're not going to find, you know, these <laughs> so because because people keep them and they use them. Right, right. And and that I mean, if the, if that's not if that's not a testament to the to the to the quality and the uh, effectiveness of a piece of equipment, then I don't know what is. Sure. Yeah. Hey, even some of like the broken ones, like you, know, you never you never get a hundred percent of the manufacturing correct. So you know we get. 1% of them that like the hook's not quite in there, right. Or whatever. We get them, we refurbish them. We, we get, we can't even keep those here. Like for like demo purposes, because somebody's always like, you know, it comes in the office like, Hey, like, can I get one right now? Like, Oh, we only have one refurbished one. Okay. You know, like, all right. Yeah. So like, we don't, we just don't have them. <laughs> so it's cool. it's I, I I know that you've been tinkering around with um, with nutrition for a while, and you know, seeing as how we're a we're a pretty hardcore uh, biohacking audience, you know, people are going to know what keto and carnivore diets are. Um, sure. It, I've also read. I'm going to I'm going to preface this by saying your suggestions for everyone are not necessarily the same things that you do for yourself because you're, you know, you're further down the path. Thank you for noticing that. Yeah. yeah like I'm, right. I'm also running experiments. I'm running experiments. So if they work out, I can share that experience. Uh, and I believe I'm, I'm part of one of the largest nutritional experiments ever done, uh, which is being, uh, spearheaded. Uh, he used the word yesterday. Uh, by uh, Dr. Sean Baker, and uh, which is carnivore nutrition. Well, there you go. But, yeah, and, and but I also wanted before we jump into nutrition, uh, I do want to say that uh, there's a lot of different approaches, and I and I am very disappointed when I see people with almost a religious attachment to a nutrition program because everybody should want to be as healthy as possible, right? Like I, I tried a vegan diet for a short period of time just so I could say I tried it like I thought. I hated every minute of it. Uh, and there was nothing, no food I looked forward to, especially because like you can't like cover your broccoli and butter if you're trying veganism, right? Like you can – I don't know what you cover it in, like salt. OK. Um, yeah, that got real old and uh, lost a ton of muscle like, you know, uh, it didn't work. But – I will say it is possible for somebody who's a vegan to grow muscle. It is possible that they can even be ketogenic. The amount of processed vegetation that they have to go through is incredible to get there. Like, like you better own an avocado farm and have a whole lot of – uh, alfalfa uh, and green pea protein isolate to uh, to be able to have any sort of uh, just basal levels of some of the macronutrients you need. And I even think that macro 
discussion is often misused, but um, it can be done. So like when I say ketogenic and intermittent fasting, it doesn't mean somebody's excluded from that. Everybody can do that. They just need to be able to, to, to prepare. Good point. Yeah. So what I advocate is a longer fasting window as long as the longest you can tolerate it because you're really giving your digestive system a break and it can regenerate its cells when it has nothing to digest, which is something we don't do. People who eat uh, three meals a day, they're not getting that that rest time for the intestines. And uh, a lot of them are dealing with chronic inflammation of the intestines. So that's that's a, a really positive aspect. That also upregulates growth hormone, uh, not to the same level as stability training, but it's a different axis of growth hormone up, upregulation. So you can enjoy both simultaneously. So like I can go, even at times I've experimented with 48 hour fasts, so I don't eat anything for 48 hours. My workout at the 47th hour, I didn't lose any strength. Like my body's running on ketones, which it's getting from metabolizing the fat from the donut I ate when I was seven years old. <laughs> right? Sure. That's how that works. <laughs> right. Right. So... Uh, well, I want to highlight I want to highlight a key point there because because I I do the same thing and I I fast until one of the questions that I ask all of my guests that we didn't get to because we just we just we just dove right in was uh, what is in your body today what have you put in your body at the time of this recording and we, we can skip that but I think one of the key points is um, if you're going to fast you should eat after your your x3 bar exercise right ah great question the anabolic window right no such thing oh i know i know that's one of my falsehoods of fitness videos that are coming up just doesn't exist yeah you you it, it you will like the idea that you can actually turn fat into muscle is a reality when you're fasting you can do that or you can at the very least preserve muscle. Uh, now, I mean, I can go through a fast and then eat a meal, and I'm I'm growing muscle and losing body fat at the same time. So, uh, and I've been doing that for a while now. So, like, ironically, a lot of the gurus out there say you can't. You got to be in one phase or the other. No, you don't. Yeah, when you're when you're uh, doing a ketogenic nutrition and you're doing intermittent fasting, um, you're getting a proper amount of nutrients with your with your meals, uh, which I don't actually think is quite basal metabolic rate, because I do feel like my appetite goes down the longer the fast I have. So like, like I used to eat three pounds of red meat a day and sometimes after a long fast, man, after I choked down too, it's like, ah, I just can't eat anymore. But I can see growth like immediately, like in two or three days, like everything's bigger, everything's measuring bigger. Uh, I take a, I take like an in-body scan. I'd, I'd prefer to do a DEXA scan, but I happen to have an in-body right down the street. Uh, from where I live in San Francisco. So, uh, yeah, like, like that, a lot of that, that stuff is just like, there's, there's no evidence of it. Okay. So the, so the, 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 the short answer or the sort of, uh, key takeaway for nutrition is fasting is good and, experiment because not everybody's we'll see we'll see right but not everybody's cut out for the carnivore diet which it sounds like you're are you still are you still doing it now yeah since last november so it's almost a year okay. i've been doing the carnivore nutrition and uh definitely leaner uh easier like just going to almost no carbohydrates 
has uh, like every once in a while somebody puts like some sort of marinade on the steak and there's also glycogen in the meat. Right. So nobody's zero carbohydrates. A lot, I hear that a lot from, from carnivores and I'm like, yeah, okay, that's not quite how that works, but right. I'll let this one go. Uh, so I, uh, you, you have less than 20 grams in a day and you stay in really hard ketosis and there's, um, I've also read some of the arguments that you need to cycle it. I don't believe that. Like it, there's, there's one study that's pretty small that you says you need to cycle out of ketosis. Uh, and so I, I just don't. And, uh, I feel fantastic all the time. The gains are phenomenal. My brain function is just dynamite. Like my power of recall. Uh, it was good before. But now uh, somebody brings up something that I'll go, yeah, I remember in 1993 I read that study. You know, everyone sort of turns their head and looks at me. Really? <laughs> <laughs> well, and apparently like uh, one of the guys that, that uh, works with me uh, at Jake Wish Biomedical, uh, he says it's, a, it's more impressive to watch you on your feet when you get a question because you'll fire out a study. Somebody ask a question like completely unscripted, you'll fire out a study and they're like, how the hell did he remember that? Uh, and part of it is this is, you know, what I'm excited about. But the other thing is, I think on this really high ketone nutrition, uh, the brain is just blistering with capability that you really don't have if you have a, a carbohydrate diet. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll attest, I'll attest to that. Yeah. I think that, that one of the smartest things that I've done in my life is go through that process of drastically limiting sugar and fasting and eating within a window. You know, yeah. I, I, I typically, I typically eat between the hours of two and eight, um, most days you know, I work out fasted plenty, uh, and it's made me, it's made me just better everywhere. It's made me a little bit smarter. It's made me, yeah. um, more mentally agile. It's allowed me to be more productive. You know, I also take, I also take, um, a, a bunch of supplements, uh, and smart drugs and, you know, mushroom supplements that we carry at natural stacks, which, um, mm -hmm. you know, frankly, I need all the help and I can get, cause I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm a little, I'm a little all over the place, but yeah, I think, I think getting, getting to the heart of what, what is going to make me the best? How can I be the absolute best version of myself, sure. um, in all aspects? And so, you know, now that we know that you're, um, that you're still eating and I, I like that you called it, uh, uh, carnivore nutrition. What do you call it? Carnivore, not carnivore diet, but carnivore. Yeah. Carnivore nutrition. Carnivore nutrition. Um, now that we know that you're doing that and still eating that way for, for the non, um, for the people that don't know what that is, or they're just getting into this, is there, is there a dietary suggestion or broad ranging, um, uh, protocol for people who are using, um, the X three bar for the first time? So there's – in the 12-week program, there's a series of nutritional videos too. And what it does is it takes somebody who's probably drinking soda and eating McDonald's fries and like week one is like you want to remove like sugar, like candy bars from your diet. Like if, because most people, if they hold themselves accountable day by day, like all I got to do is avoid candy bars. Oh, yeah, I can do that. I've gone a week before without eating candy bars. And so once you make it through one week, you go, I can do that every week. Like it's not, I'm not dying for a candy bar every day. So uh, week by week, you start eliminating some things from the diet until you get to something, to a low level of ketogenic nutrition with some intermittent fasting with a, a pretty manageable eating window. So like, Skipping breakfast, everybody skip breakfast when they're running late. Now, people who have right. very poor insulin sensitivity get angry when they don't have a meal right away. Or like people who are hypoglycemic. Interesting. I was hypoglycemic as a kid. 
because my mom would feed me and the same thing. All moms feed their kids like cereal and all kinds of crap, uh, highly processed garbage. And as soon as I went to ketogenic nutrition 12 years ago, like my hand stopped shaking. Like it just never happened again. And that was just crystal clear to me like, wow, I can like skip a meal and not feel ill or be angry at all. Yeah. That's awesome. So I knew I was on the right track even, even back then. And then it's just gotten better and better. And I, and I really am enjoying the carnivore nutrition program. Uh, so b- basically, uh, my, my nutrition is steak, uh, red meat's the most digestible, but I'll also do eggs or chicken or, uh, turkey or, or something like that. Fattier meats, the better. And then, uh, and water. Yeah. So the, and then I, I basically one meal a day. So I'm like eating big, windows 30 minutes. Wow. One thing that I haven't seen noted or, or specified in the carnivore nutrition protocol is emphasis on grass fed. Is that a thing? Great point. Uh, grass fed does get talked about, especially by the biohacking community. And, um, I have started to not care for grass fed beef because it, it doesn't have the proper amount of fat. Now, ultimately, if you look at what a predator eats, so if a, if a, a leopard is going to chase down a gazelle, is it going to try and catch the fastest, youngest, most powerful one? Or is it going to pick the older one that's not eating high enough on the trees and maybe a little fatter and maybe a little lazier. Huh? It's going to have the weak one. Yeah. I thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the, I I don't agree with cruelty towards animals. So I, I don't like the way a lot of like factory processed meats go, but what you'll see is grass fed and then corn finished. Right. And so the idea there is corn is like candy to a cow. It's not cruel to feed that to them. They're not in torture, but it ha- it's much higher glycemic index type food. So they're – and of course they, they, they're not, they don't have a lot of foresight. They kind of have lizard brains. So they'll, they'll eat anything that's put in, put in front of them that's edible. And so they prefer the corn. If you put a trough of corn in a field of grass, they'll eat the corn. So uh, I just want to point that out because I, I don't want people to get confused thinking it's cruel to uh, serve them corn. Some of the other things that happen to cows could be managed much better for the comfort of the animal. But ultimately, uh, having a fattier piece of meat is much more beneficial than to have a leaner piece of meat. Yeah, ribeyes are always the choice. And like if I if I have uh, if I can't get a ribeye, I have to go to a place that's only got like strip steak. I might get like three strip steaks uh, at a restaurant, and then I'll go home and maybe uh, do ten scrambled eggs. So I get enough fat. How do you like your meat cooked? Uh pretty rare. Yeah. 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 Like not raw on the inside, uh, warm, but ultimately bacteria can manifest on the surface of a cut piece of meat, not on the inside. So you sear the outside and the inside's pretty good. Making, Almost raw. Making me hungry, man. What, what, what time of day do you eat? <laughs> I'm making myself hungry. I was just thinking about that. <laughs> uh, I have six or eight dinner reservations tonight. The uh, whole whole company is going out to dinner at this great place that's got some uh, pretty big ribeyes, so I'm going to have a pair of those. Yeah. We could keep going for hours and hours, but I want to be sensitive to your time. Um, I want to just share one more time how, how impressed I am with the results that I'm getting, and that's all that matters. Yeah, it is. That's really – that's really the only thing that fucking matters in to yeah. me in in working out is like, d- am I getting bigger and stronger? And I have I have goals, I have physique goals, and um, 
and it's working and it's fun and it's easy and it's fast and it checks all the boxes for like classic biohacking um, stuff. And so I, I, I'm going to keep on it. Um, but I, I ask, I ask all my guests kind of the same, uh, the same question at the end of every episode, which is, um, based on, based on everything that, you know, not specifically in, um, product design or research, but just sort of generally, um, if you could answer or finish, complete this sentence, everyone should know that you're asking a researcher <laughs> when everybody should know, like, oh man, <laughs> I, I could give a 10 hour lecture on that. I could talk all day. <laughs> Uh, everyone should know that what they've been taught about exercise, most of it's just wrong and they need to be much more open-minded because it's, it's, uh, just, just a lot of holes, a lot of things missing and, uh, we're plugging those holes. I think growth hormone, for example, what upregulates growth hormone, to, uh, only the understanding this this principle of human physiology of stabilization and firing was discovered in 2016 in that research study, that meta-analysis with the 23 different data sets. So, so like these sort of standards of fitness that were basically being carried from the 1970s, uh, most of them are just incorrect and force most people to spin their wheels. So billions of dollars of supplements sold billions of dollars are spent in the gym industry. Uh, the home fitness industry is four or five times greater than even the gym industry. Yet you walk down the street and almost nobody looks fit. So before getting upset that the cha- that the, some of the principles that Arnold Schwarzenegger was using back in the 1970s, are being challenged by me or Dave Asprey or Tony Robbins, uh, and there's plenty of other people that are challenging these things, before getting upset about it, take note that almost no one makes progress with the principles that are being passed around today. And there's just better ways to do it. That's excellent information. I think that's 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 information that everybody needs to hear and needs to hear it over and over and over so that we can sort of reprogram what we think we know. Before we go, uh, what's the best place for people to get a hold of you or learn more? So uh, we, we, of course, uh, on, on Instagram, I'm at Dr. Jakewish, D-R-J-A-Q-U-I-S-H. Uh, answer any questions there. The uh, on Facebook, there's a Dr. John Jaquish page. There's also an X3 bar page. Uh, the staff is is uh, there to answer all kinds of questions and also to get the product. It's x3bar.com. And there's also a discount for the listeners. It's OPP. And that gives you $50 off the product. Thanks for joining us on the Optimal Performance Podcast. Absolutely. Sean, thanks so much for having me.